Facebook, and I think we are. I see the finger. He's giving me the thumbs up. Hold on. All right, now we're live. Wonderful. Hello, family of faith. Hi. Wonderful. I love hearing your excited voices, seeing your excited faces, having the opportunity sometimes to spend just a couple minutes with you in the lobby before service starts really, really affects my heart and it changes it. It it gets my mind focused. That's why I always ask you how you're doing because I want to hear you say okay because I know you're doing okay and it brings joy to us just to hear that, doesn't it? You know, in that song we heard, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. You know, my mom walked in the door and the first thing she said to me was, I came here expecting the Holy Spirit to speak to me. That's why we're here, isn't it? We're here, we're expecting God to do something, aren't we? We're here, as the song said, here I am, Lord. In that song, he says, is it I, Lord? But we know for the last year and a half, God's been telling us it is us. Is it, do we not? Amen. We don't have to go past that point because we know it is us, and that's why we are here. You know, this is kind of an exciting week. I had a little bit of a chance to get some extra sleep and energy. Grandma took the kids for me on Saturday, which was really nice. Amy was out with my sisters, and I had the house to myself for the first time in probably, I don't know, several years. So I decided just to take it easy for a little bit. I sat down, and I watched a documentary on the National Geographic Channel called The Rescue. It's a pretty neat documentary about these 12 kids, ages 11 to 16, who were on a soccer team in northern Thailand in 2018, and they went out to explore this cave. Shortly after they entered the cave, it started to rain, and the waters rose, and it flooded the cave, blocking their only way out, trapping them inside. So naturally, when the kids didn't return home, the parents went out looking for them, and they found all their bicycles outside the cave. Now, most of you know this. I see you nodding your heads already. This story actually made headlines all across the world. When this happened, 110... 110 Thai Navy SEALs, joined by trained divers all around the world, came together with a rescue plan. They all worked together for 12 12 to 14 hours a day, every day. And after four days, they only found that they moved a couple meters inside the cave. But they couldn't make it any further because of the water rising and the ongoing rains and the currents. The rain was so bad that they were pumping out 400,000 gallons of water every hour for 24 hours a day, every day, and the water kept rising. A team of engineers, Jim, a team of engineers actually moved an entire waterfall. I mean, it's crazy when you look at how they did it. They literally moved this waterfall miles, miles away from the cave because the waterfall kept filling up the cave. At this point, with the entrance being flooded and the waters rising uncontrollably, and the Navy SEALs being unable to make it inside, everyone started to presume the worst had happened, and the parents were literally told by the officials that they would have to wait several months for the waters to recede until they could retrieve the bodies of their children. But there happened to be a British man there that was on site, that had spent most of his life exploring this particular cave. And he told the officials, listen, there's a good chance that these kids are still alive. He said, inside there's many caverns that the kids could have fled to higher grounds, escaping the water, or escaping the rising waters. And when he told the, uh, the, the officials of Thailand this, he told the prime minister of Thailand, if you want to rescue these kids, these are the men that you need to come rescue them. And he gave them a list of three names. Their names are Jonathan Volathin, who was an IT consultant, Richard Stanton, who was a retired firefighter, and Rob Harper, who was an emergency critical care veterinarian. Now, for a hobby, to be fair, these guys do cave dive. So they have the experience. And five days after showing up, these men discovered all the children and their coach alive, 2.5 miles inside the cave. 
trapped from the rising waters. Now, of course, in that initially, everybody was excited over this great news. But they all agreed that they were terrified. They said they truly believed that they were going to be the last people to ever see these kids alive. They kept asking themselves, how are we going to get these kids out? The trained Navy SEALs were unable to make it 200 meters inside the cave. And now these kids are over 4,000 meters inside the cave. They have no training at all. They're weak and tired from being underground with lack of water and food. So for the next nine days, these men went back and forth bringing food to the kids and water and spending time with them. But as they were going back and forth, they were laying rope on the ground so they knew the right route to take. Eventually, a few Navy SEALs were able to make their way in by holding the rope that they laid on the ground. But unfortunately, one of them, Samen Goonan, died in the cave when his breather apparatus was ripped from his mouth because of the rushing waters. At this point, it looked completely hopeless. No one knew what to do, and they knew eventually the little oxygen that was trapped in the cave with the kids was dropping levels and was becoming dangerous to breathe. Time was literally running out, and there was no way to rescue these kids. One of the men con contacted his friend who happened to be an anesthesiologist and asked, what if we put these kids under so they fall asleep and we just simply swim them on out? Of course, the doctor said no and gave a, list, gave a dozen reasons why this wouldn't work and the kids would automatically suffocate. After a few hours of weighing all the options and knowing these kids only had a day left of oxygen before they died inside the cave, the doctor said, well, we could leave them inside to die, or we could at least try to rescue them. So 18 days into these kids being trapped inside, the divers went into the cave, gave, this kid, gave the kids a shot that put them to sleep. They tied the breathing masks around them, tied the kids to themselves, and they went through the black, muddy, murky waters with one hand holding the kid's up, head up so he wouldn't suffocate, and the other hand on the rope. They said as divers, I don't know if anybody's ever been a diver before, I know I never have, but I know climbing ropes in the military, they always tell you you want to at least have one point of contact. Because if you have one point of contact, you're not going to slip. But these divers said, as divers do, you always want to have two hands on the rope. And the most terrifying thing for them was knowing that they had to have one hand on this kid's neck while the other hand held the rope. And if they wanted to make it out of the tunnel, they would have to let go of that rope slightly so they could move forward. But they knew if they let go of that rope completely, they would be lost in those waters and they would die there. This is truly a fascinating thing that was watching unfold. I mean, when you think about it, there were over 10,000 volunteers on the grounds. Over 2,000 soldiers from all these countries all over the world. Tons of trained divers. And the only thing that could ensure the survival was a single rope that was laying on the ground of a cave that was flooded with mud and rocks and all kinds of debris. And if they let go of that rope, they knew they would die. The man said the worst part was knowing that if he let go of that rope, it wasn't him that was dying but it was that child that would die. He said knowing that the kid's survival depended on him holding that rope firmly was the only thing going through his mind. Now, thank the Lord, most of you know, eventually they did bring all these children outside side alive, and they were all rescued safely. And like I said, it's truly a fascinating documentary worth watching. And like I said, to me, what I found the most amazing about it was there were over 200 trained divers, 2,000 soldiers from various militaries, 110 Thai Navy SEALs, 10,000 volunteers, all kinds of engineers who were on the ground, who literally tried cutting holes into the mountain to make ways for the kids to escape. And in the end, in the very end, it came down to these men 
who came in as unpaid volunteers and risked their lives to save the kids. Bear has a picture for us of these men. You see these men? As the one on the left, Richard, said, the looks on the Navy SEALs' faces were priceless when they were told that experts were coming to take over the rescue attempt and they seen these slouchy older men come walking in telling the SEALs that they could do what the SEALs couldn't do. Now, as I, as I watched this documentary, I was constantly reminded of a testimony found in Acts chapter 9 that is often overlooked. Now, to give you a bit of the situation before we get into that testimony, if you remember in Acts 7, Stephen was just martyred, and Saul approved of it. As we moved into chapter or Acts 8 a few weeks ago, we found that the church was scattered because of the persecution going on. But despite that, we've seen that God was still at work and he was still performing miracles as he directed Philip to the Ethiopian in the desert. As we move into Acts 9, most of you know that's why, where we find Saul's conversion on his way to Damascus as he had an encounter with Jesus who blinds Saul and then tells him to go see Ananias. After Saul's vision is restored, we then find in Acts chapter 9, verses 20 through 31, Saul spent several days in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All of those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then, through, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord, encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Now that's probably a passage of scripture that many of you have read many times in your lives. And it's truly an amazing testimony. I mean, is it not? Saul was hunting down followers of Christ. But he recently came to the Lord for salvation. And immediately he's preaching that Jesus is, son of the, is the Son of God. I mean, if you were living in that times and you knew who Saul was, that would be amazing for you. It truly baffled the people because they knew Saul was on his way to arrest them. But instead, he's preaching Jesus. And it baffled the people because he proved that Jesus is the Messiah. God tells us that this made the Jews angry and they plotted a conspiracy to kill him. Day and night, everywhere Saul went, he had to watch over his shoulders. It got so bad that in the middle of the night, Saul had to escape and he needed help from his followers who lowered him by a rope in a basket over the city walls. We find when Saul got to Jerusalem, we find Barnabas, the son of encouragement, taking him in under his wing because the other disciples were scared of him. And while he was there in Jerusalem, the Jews there tried killing him too. I mean, there's a lot going on here. 
in this testimony. And one of the most important people in this testimony are the ones that are often overlooked. Can anybody guess who those people are? Anybody? The rope holders. You ever stop and think about that? The ones who lowered Saul down in the basket are so often overlooked, but they're a crucial piece to this testimony. I mean, you stop and think what faith it must have took to hold the ropes. I mean, these people had no idea at the time what they were doing or who was even in the basket. All they knew is that this man, Saul, the persecutor, is now preaching faith in Christ. There was no way these people could have known the impact this man would have on the world and the Christian faith. This was the Apostle Paul, God's chosen instrument to bring the good news to Jews and Gentiles alike. He wrote over two-thirds of the New Testament, and he reared up many disciples and even 12 apostles. But as we see, despite all of that, Paul could not have achieved his calling by himself. He needed help. You see, we know Paul's life was in danger, wasn't it? His life was being threatened, and he needed to get out of the city quick or be killed. So in the middle of the night, some other believers put him in a basket, and they held the ropes that lowered him over the city walls to safety. You know, when I look at this part of the body of families of faith called Midweek Connections, I keep asking God, what are you trying to accomplish with us? What I mean is, I don't think I'm here holding the ropes for any of you, am I? No. We're on our way out, aren't we? Unfortunately, we're going to be leaving this earth sooner than later. And we're going to our other home. So knowing this, that leaves us with some questions. Questions like, who are we holding the rope for? Are we holding a rope at all? And what is even holding a rope look like? I think the easiest way to answer all three of those questions is by looking at the last one. What does holding a rope look like? Now to start, we know for the disciples found in Acts chapter 9 that holding the ropes that lowered Paul in the basket, for them, they had to give up some of their time to make this happen. We know this because it was in the middle of the night when people would have been sleeping, when they would have been sleeping. But instead, they're helping Paul escape. We know that they were willing to sacrifice their lives to help Paul. If you stop and think about it, the mob wanted to kill Paul for nothing other than preaching the gospel. And if the ones that helped him escape were caught, they surely would have been killed too. If you stop and think about it, really, they had nothing personally to gain from this, but everything to lose. And rather than being concerned for themselves, they held the ropes as they lowered Paul to go be the man that God called Paul to be and bring the gospel message to the people. So from ju this, just this alone, just from the disciples' testimony, we know that in order to hold the ropes, it's going to cost us something, isn't it? It means we have to be that willing sacrifice, that living sacrifice that Jesus asks us to be. We know we're not holding the ropes for each other. So that means we're holding the ropes for the next generation, doesn't it? Holding the ropes for the next generation can look different in every one of our lives. And it truly does look different. If you think about Chuck and Jackie, Chuck and Jackie taking in their grandkids so they could have a chance in life, teaching them and guiding them in the ways of the Lord is literally holding the ropes for Zach and Tanae. Rachel, taking the next step in her life last week, has given her the ability now to hold the rope for her great-granddaughter, 
who has recently discovered who the Lord is. And now it's Rachel's prayer that God uses her great-granddaughter Zoe to bring Christ to Zoe's parents. Every Sunday, every Sunday after Duke is finished with worship, he takes his time to come down to the children's room and sing Jesus Loves Me with all the kids. And Duke has no idea what this will do in those kids' lives. But there's a little girl in there named Isabel who loves to sing, and she loves to be part of our worship time. And one day she said to me, she wants to be like Duke when she grows up singing in the worship team. Every time Duke comes in there and sings Jesus Loves Me with them, he's holding the ropes for them. And one day that little girl will grow up to be in her church's worship team. And she'll remember Duke, who took his time to come and sing with them. Truthfully, anything we do that provides an opportunity for others to have a closer relationship with the Lord is holding the ropes for them. A perfect example is of a young pastor named Mordecai Ham. You guys remember who he was? We, ta- we, we talked about him about maybe six or eight months ago. If you don't remember, Mordecai wrote about a revival he was preaching in 1934 in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mordecai wrote that two young high school boys have been attending our meetings. They thought that everything I said was directed their way. So this time, they decided to take seats in the choir behind me, where I couldn't point my finger at them. They didn't pretend to be singers. They just wanted to sit behind me. So I let them sit there. Even though the one boy, Grady Wilson, agreed that neither of them could sing. Mordecai continues to say, One night, a man spoke to them during the invitation and said, Come on, let's go up front. So Grady and his friend Billy both went to the altar Grady, who was already saved, dedicated his life to Christian service. And his friend Billy accepted Christ's salvation there that day at the altar. Mordecai recalls, I told Grady and Billy after they came forward that they now go get to go sit in the preacher's section. And Billy sat there for two months. Mordecai said the Lord seemed to be directing everything. And what took place during that meeting didn't seem to have any earthly explanation. But that night, in 1934, was the night that young Billy Graham accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior and went on to be one of the biggest gospel preachers that we've had to date. Think about that. As we begin to close, let me just say that this once again, once again, God is showing us the importance of the entire body, the entire body of Christ. And that means even us, the ones who are a little bit older and a little bit disabled, right? I know I kind of say I'm old all the time, and you guys kind of tell me I'm not because there is an age difference, and then i got to come back and tell you it's not about the age, it's about the mileage, right? My body is constantly riddled with pain, and I know what it's like. But just like the ear needs the stapedias to hear, we need each other to function and survive. And in case you don't know what that all means, that was a message I preached about a year ago about the stapedias, which is a little muscle that is six millimeters in length inside the back of your ear. And without that muscle, you would not be able to hear anything properly. That's how important it is. Yeah, it's never seen. It's not looked upon as part of the ear, but it's one of the biggest functions of the ear. The Apostle Paul had many people working with him through his entire ministry. And he needed them in order to accomplish the will of God for his life. No part of ministry in the church is unimportant. No person in the church is unimportant. Remember Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6? There is one body, 
and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. There's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There's one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. God's Word tells us the importance of each other inside the church, doesn't it? Anybody ever think God made a mistake? No. So if God's never made a mistake, and He tells you that you are His handiwork in Christ, created in Christ Jesus to do His good works, then that means what? You are. Amen? And we are all important, and we are all here for a reason. You know, when I think of those slouchy, older men that came and who were able to rescue those kids, when $9 million trained professionals and several militaries from all around the world were unable to do so, it just blows my mind looking at those guys. I mean, I wish I was in that room when they, when they walked in and the Navy SEALs were looking at them. Their faces had to have been priceless. I mean, do these look like the people who would come and rescue children and trapped inside a cave when the government is there? No, these don't look like the people. But they volunteered their time and their lives to come do this. I think how Richard Stanton, the man on the left, said the most important thing was making sure that he held on to the rope so that those kids could survive and have a future. So Midweek Connections, now that we have the answer to our third question, we could go back to the first two questions. Who are we holding a rope for? And are we holding a rope at all? If you are holding a rope for others to be able who God... Who do, for them to be able to who, be who God called them to be, then praise the Lord. But if you're not, if you're not holding the ropes for someone else, then look around the city. There are tons of young adults here at Families of Faith trying to be who God called them to be. And we know that our adversary, the devil, he walks about as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. He's looking to kill, still, and destroy. And we have the opportunity to be the ones that hold the ropes for these kids in, our, in their lives so that they can go on and be who God called them to be. Remember, there's only one body and one spirit, just as we were called the one hope when we were called. There's one Lord. One faith and one baptism. There's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now while holding the rope for someone else might seem menial, remember the truth. It has eternal value. Just like those that were holding the ropes for Saul had no idea who was in that basket Mordecai Ham had no idea who was in his basket when he allowed that young boy, Billy, to sit in the choir, even though he wasn't part of it. God has a lot of baskets here at Families of Faith, does he not? And we're being invited to join God where he's at work and hold the ropes for those coming in after us. I don't know if you guys remember but when I was six years old, I knew this is what God wanted from me. I knew it. But guess what the problem was? I had nobody to hold the ropes for me. I had nobody to guide me and teach me the correct ways. I had nobody to, to give me hope, to encourage me. And as I grew, guess what I had? The world and all it had to offer. And unfortunately, we live in this fleshly body and sometimes we desire things we shouldn't desire. And we grasp onto things we shouldn't grasp onto. 
And I couldn't imagine if I had somebody like Pastor Clark in my life when I was six years old, where I'd be today. But praise the Lord, even in the last moments of Pastor Clark's life, he did exactly what the message tells us to do. Hold the ropes for someone else. And if you look, Pastor Clark wasn't just holding the ropes for me, was he? He had a team of guys he was holding the ropes for. And he was rearing them up to be the men that God called them to be. And we have that opportunity here at Families of Faith. I mean, how fitting is it that not only are we a church, but we're also a school. We're a school full of children that have a desire and a heart to come learn about what, the God, ha- what God has for them in their lives. Some of these children already know their calling in life. They need someone to come along and step, to stand and help them. And praise God that he sent us Pastor John, amen? Because he's been doing a great job with these kids. But guess what? Pastor John's one guy and these kids keep numbering, don't they? I, when he got here, there was a lot less kids than there are today. And he needs us. He needs us to stand next to him and hold these ropes with him as these kids continue to learn and grow to the Lord. And God's giving us that opportunity. Praise God. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Father God, I just want to say thank you, Lord, not just for this body called Families of Faith, but all the bodies that you've created here in this world, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving mankind enough to continue to invest in us, Lord. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come to you through your son, Jesus. Thank you for the, for the sacrifice he made on the cross for us, Lord, so that we can have a right relationship with you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for even in the midst of our own stinking thinking that you, you correct our minds constantly and you constantly uplift us and tell us that we are the ones that you asked to be here. And we're here for you today, Lord. Lord, our minds are simple Our thoughts are not like your thoughts, and our ways are not like your ways. But Lord, we ask that you continue to give us your wisdom, Father, your love, your peace, and your patience to be the men and women you called us to be. Lord, you've already given us the opportunity to hold the ropes for those children here at Families of Faith. Father, I just pray now you give us the wisdom to to know how to do so. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you're going to continue to do. In Jesus' name, we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Barry, you could go ahead and stop that video.